Before I give my final remarks, I'm going to invite back up to the stage uh, Lisa Dussault, DTI's C Chief Technology Officer, so we can talk a little bit more about our tech work. This has been a policy-centric day, but DTI is a very much a two-part organization, so excited to sort of have this time to dig in a little bit with her once I get my questions up. Thank you all. This is a long day. It's a long day on data portability. We are very pleased for it, uh, but we're conscious of the fact that it's towards the end of a long day. However, Lisa and I are out here from California. For us, it's only 1.20 p.m., so we're just going to keep going for a little bit and then see you all at the reception afterwards. Keep everybody awake 34, 30, 30 more minutes. Oh, I think that last panel helped us all wake up. That was yeah. pretty great, too. Yeah. It was really good to have them. All right. First off, let me give you a pretty open-ended one. Lisa, can you give uh, everyone here a sense of the landscape of this portability and interoperability work today? How are things going? I don't mean protocol interoperability. That's its own thing. There's a standards process for that under IETF. But the larger world of helping different systems interconnect through structured data. Right. Um, I think we see three um, major forms that structured data is, inter is exchanged. And I think probably the bulk one is downloading users downloading from one site and uploading to another site. And to the extent that that works, and sometimes there's loss in downloading, and sometimes there's loss in uploading um, information that just can't be ported over to the other system or is not in the right format, uh, still, it's, it's pretty common. I ported my reading history, my hundreds of books on Goodreads, to the StoryGraph and did that successfully because the StoryGraph bothered to um, parse that export format that Goodreads decided upon. Um, I think the, probably the second most common is um, unilaterally web APIs that a company puts up a web API and says, well, this is what we're doing. And when those um, web, web, web APIs are well documented, that is actually pretty successful. Um, but it is a privilege to be a company that is big enough to be able to do that and just say, this is how we're doing it. Uh, and expect other people to uh, accommodate that. Uh, and I th the third one is probably old school protocols. Um, IMAP is still, uh, IMAP and POP are still a way you can migrate your mail from one server to another, either by giving them, by giving the same um, entity both passwords, or by giving one of the entities the other one's password, or by doing it all via client, which isn't available to everybody who doesn't have a fast internet connection or a laptop. But still, uh, many of these old standards still have really uh, beneficial effects in the, in the landscape. So that, that's the big three kinds I see. And our uncertainty about how often these are all used and how successful they are is um, one of the things that's been bothering me since starting on this work. I like yes. to have numbers. I'm an engineer. Yeah. And so, as you know, but we can tell the whole group here, um, we are about to launch a site that offers people articles on how to get these problems solved. If you want to know how to move your reading history from Goodreads to the story graph, there's an article. Um, and, and it explains that it is possible and it is good. And here, go here to learn more. But while researching articles for this site, I found out, for example, that Evernote is terrible. Evernote took back its ex export features that allowed uh, interchange with other sites, and it's gotten worse, and it's locked more of its users in as it has gotten, in Clay Shirky's words, in Um Corey Doctorow, actually. Oh, Corey Doctorow, yes. oh, thank you. I'm, they they this, it oh, happened the same good. space in my head, and I just swapped names. I, I, think Cor <laughs> I think Clay was probably mad that Corey thought of it first. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to those guys, both of them. Um, yeah, so the port map um, DT init project is going to announce, uh, going to be announced soon. So stay tuned for that. And part of the point of writing these articles is not just to write them and help people, which is half the point, but the other half is to collect data on which articles people are querying, which ones they visit, having uh, good anonymous data analytics on the site, so we can see what use cases people really are asking about. So now everybody can hear why I was so excited to bring Lisa up, because there's this rich layer of developments happening in the portability world that are tangentially intersecting with the regulatory conversations that are so present today. But in this, in this complex space of users who, who can take advantage of this but may not be aware of it, or may be frustrated because they've tried it and it's a lossy experience, there's, I think, so, so much more that we can do uh, here. And, and, and it's, a, it's a very large part of what we want to do as an organization, so I'm really glad to have the chance to showcase it. Um, 
Again, we've talked a lot today about regulation. The DMA's implementation deadline is coming up next week. The policy world feels very urgent on these portability spaces. Do you see that same sense of urgency in the standards communities that you're starting to re-engage with for us and the partners and the, and the, and the engineers? Are there sources of sort of awareness or, or, or reasons for this urgency apart from the regulatory pressure that's coming down the pike? How are you feeling about that sort of time, timeliness? Um, well, first of all, let me st set the stage a little bit yeah. by saying that um, 20 years ago, 1999, almost 25 years ago, Web 2.0 was big, right? This, that was the, the year that Web 2.0 was named. And for me, uh, I was involved in standards at the time. This was a time when I started seeing with, a, with some dismay. I mean, Web 2.0 brought a lot of great features and services to lots of people, but I could see with increasing dismay that it was just pulling all the energy out of standards work. When a website can put up its, its functions and its web API unilaterally saying, hey, take it or leave it, it's what we're doing, there was a lot less pull to participate in standards communities. And that's particularly at the apps layer. If you take a look at the Internet Engineering Task Force, it's just as big as it always was, but almost all the work is happening at the routing and the transport and the security layers and not at the application layer. Um, the W3C is restructuring. I hope that um, continues to go well. I think it is. I'm very happy to see it happening. Oh, let me pause quickly for the policy, true policy wonks in the room. W3C is? The World Wide Web Consortium. <laughs> Another acronym, but not one that's known as much in this town. Thank you. Please continue. Yeah. And they're important because they're the home for standards like uh, certain um, schemas and the activity pub protocol and a number of other things that are used in portability, whereas the IETF has tri traditionally been the home for standards around email, including email portability and calendars and OAuth, which is another important building block. Um, and there is no generally good home for schemas. Schemas sometimes have a home in one place or another, but no, the, the schemas that um, Joe talked about for immersive reality are not standardized in either the W3C or the ITF. So those are in entirely different organizations and it's, in, it's incredibly fragmented. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Clearly there's a lot of work to be done in standards bodies. A lot of this work, as you say, is not being done in standards bodies. It's being done in other places. Uh, do, you, do you see a sort of a shift here? Uh, do, do we need to have more in standards bodies, more that can move more quickly outside of standards bodies? What do you see as the sort of path, uh, not just the, the present state, but the path over the next few months and years to try to make good progress on, on addressing these disparities? I'm optimistic, um, which is why I leaped in to get involved. Yeah. Um, so yes, I, I do hope we'll have more of that, and I do think that the that the standards, um, the governance is important. The legitimacy and the transparency of a group making decisions about yes, here is how we're going to express an interchange and avatar. Here is how we're going to uh, send somebody's music playlist. Um, that that eventually needs to happen for it to become uh, accountable. It, it but it it can't be. It can't often be led there because the standards work is just so slow. Even though I see some momentum being pushed back, some energy being put back into the system, for the standards communities to respond to that and train people how to participate in standards and then come out with standards the other end, it is a long, slow, painful process. Uh, and I, I'm hoping, to, I, I think I see that energy coming back and that process beginning, but it is slow and it can't, we can't wait for standards to start learning more. So there's a lot about what you said that resonates with me and just sort of very briefly anecdotally when I was first talking, talking to the, the board of DTI about joining the organization I had some sidebars with friends in the standards community because this is a different process. The work that we're doing technically, the way that we're helping to uh, coordinate and to uh, catalyze building of data, data transfer tools is not fully intersected with standards and as you say it's not waiting on standards. So I went out to my friends in the standards world and said hey how do you feel about this? How is this model jiving with what you're trying to do? Do you see this as sort of competition for standards processes? What do you think about it? And, and universally, the response I got back was favorable because standards take a, such a long time and it's very important to have these kinds of flexible collaboration, coordination type approaches and then to sort of learn by doing in many senses. I think that there's so much that we can't learn until we have products out in the world. 
Um, there are a lot of obstacles to that, though, right? What are the obstacles to us sort of getting out there and building more and doing more work? How, what, what is, what is, <laughs> this is, this is a very blunt way of putting it. And of course, I, I could give my own answer to this too, but, but Lisa, please give me yours. What's taking so long? Yeah. Um, well, I'm very happy to be working with, with you specifically and all the lawyers and policy people in this room and broader because clear regulation will help. I'm quite looking forward to continued work and regulation and, and um, also enjoyed the last panel on, on that kind of thing. Um, it, there, it does take time to spin up and um, companies um, that stopped sending their people to standards groups maybe 10 years ago uh, need time to spin up that expertise. Like, there, there are fewer people with the expertise to uh, get in a room and, and hammer out compromises about, about schemas than there were 20 years ago. I think, I think purely fewer, not, but definitely fewer relative to the size of the tech industry today. Um, time, um, the fragmentation is pretty dire. There's a very long tail of small apps and small companies and poor interoperability and privacy and portability and all of that stuff. Uh, and the fragmentation between um, what a small, between, between what a company wants to do and what, it, what tools it can conceive of doing to solve problems. Like a small company that's trying to do a good job has to be like, what do they have to do? They have to implement the Google API and get Google to accept a key and implement um, a, a Microsoft API and get Microsoft to accept their key and on and on and on. It's the, the fragmentation itself is hard. The uncertainty is hard. Yeah, there's always been a, a scaling challenge here. And I think um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about sort of our history with the data transfer project and the way the data transfer project was set up a few years back to try to get at some of these scaling challenges. Because this, I don't think, is well understood. And, and of course, what we've talked about today is not just about our data transfer project code and the tools that we help catalyze in that sense. But, but it, that's an important, I think, example and story to be told about how we get across some of these scaling challenges. So could you please sort of tell our audience a little bit more about how that model in particular works? There's scaling deep and there's scaling wide. Oh, great. Great point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you have to do them both. Yeah. And so um, we can't get the big companies to really do a great job of portability unless the solutions scale deep for them. When they have millions of users, they have to be able to run servers that export 15 megabyte, 15 gigabytes of somebody's mail or 50 gigabytes of somebody's photos. And so that's the scaling deep problem. But the scaling broad means that that if, if a user needs their their photos or their email to go to some place that is not a big company, that should still be possible. And scaling broad means scaling trust processes uh, and inter and and the discoverability of of what companies can do. Um, so it's about URLs and it's about certificates and and. Uh, registries of, of it, it, we don't know how to solve this yet, but there's certainly technical ways of solving it because it's been solved for the certificate authorities and for the DNS. So no, this is great, and it's sorry, also, getting, getting no, a little you're bit, good, you're you, good. This is good. You're right, just cut me off at some yeah, point. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I mean it's it's also very much it's starting to dovetail with the question that Mark Scott asked me on the panel at the end of the morning, which is about getting smaller companies to to really be part of this and to and and how to help them. Um, understand and get involved, and I, 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 you know, I kicked it to Allied for Startups and to some of the other groups that are setting up as sort of interstitials. But um, what are you thinking about for for ways that we can help small companies get involved in this and become data recipients? Right. This also goes to. Let me, sorry, I'm riffing a little bit more. These cards um, pointing around. I already referenced one of them, which is is one of the ones that I've gotten the most positive feedback about, which is that in portability in 2024, supply exceeds demand. Right, we're building a lot of portability, but yet we haven't really, I think, crossed that threshold of, of setting up a world where small businesses really are chomping at the bit to get to the data, even though there is opportunity and there is value there. Um, what are you thinking about for how we can reach into that world? And I mean, you can't, you can't force it, but how can we help raise awareness? I, I'm not sure exactly where I'm going with this, forgive me. Uh, yeah. what, what do we do to help 
cl close that supply demand problem, you think? Yeah, uh, it's great being here today because I've had a chance to think over this at a really strategic level. And I keep on thinking about consolidating, consolidating progress and consolidating scattered pieces. So even if the pieces are there to do, uh, to almost do data portability for ActivityPub, let's consolidate those pieces and say, if you put this piece and this piece and this piece together, that is how you do it. Uh, and write, write a document that explains that. Um, consolidating the, um, some of the processes uh, are, so that there's fewer brokers, fewer uh, other agents that somebody has to talk to to, to start working. Consolidating, consolidating progress so that it becomes stable because we've seen APIs that used to uh, enable some data portability and some research disappear in the last couple of years. Uh, and that's that's very harmful. It's very harmful to to try to start to try to rely on that and have the the rug pulled out from under you because the the companies only offered this platform as long as it was convenient and not because it was the right thing to do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Consolidate right. progress and consolidate information and do that under any kind of decent governance. Fortunately, we're working in an organization that's trying to be a hub for all of these issues. And yes. so we have, I think, the platform to do just that. Uh, my final question for you, uh, anything else that we should be sort of talking to this crowd about for DTI's technology investments and our standards work besides DTP? You mentioned the portability map a little bit, a little bit more on that or anything else that, that we should be sort of sharing at this stage of what the future head looks like for our technology work? Well, my big three priorities right now are um, launching this site that gathers data on how people want to port their data um, and getting contributions of articles. Um, if you have any ideas for how I can get articles, Chris said I should like get a whole class of law students and have their professor make them write articles, which I think is a great idea. If you have other ideas how I can get articles and traffic to this site, it will help us gather data around where the real holes are, whether people are infuriated with Evernote and think Google Takeout is actually pretty awesome, for example, personal opinion, but I think it could be supported by the data. Um, the next priority I have is uh, working on ActivityPub uh, portability in particular, because I think that standards effort is active, it's live, there's people to work with, and they're so close. They just need like two or three more pieces and tie and how to tie them together to be able to show how to do portability. And then the implementations which are actively being worked on with the energy that the Mastodon community is getting and other activity pub um, implementers, it's it's a very promising area to work right now. Uh, so I'm, I'm plugged into the W3C to do that. And the third one is support is, is working on trust model stuff. I think there's a lot of technical details and meat to figuring out how should companies decide to trust other companies with, per, with personal data. Um, and what, is, what, is, what does it mean to meet the bar? And how do, you, how do you trust the other party, even when you've tried to, to, decided to trust them in theory, how do you trust them in practice? How do you trust this connection coming in? Yeah, I'm excited for that work. Obviously, I've been working on it as well, but very excited to have you jumping in and joining us for the next stage. So thank yeah. you. Thank you for giving us that overview. And, and before I move on to sort of final, final comments, uh, does anyone have any questions for Lisa about sort of our technical work in that roadmap ahead? I did not tell her that I was going to invite people to ask questions. However, she can handle it. She's a professional. <laughs> Got at least one. Thank you, Cornelia. Uh, super interesting. Um, uh, thank you very much for, for explaining your work here. Um, and I'm not entirely sure, it's probably a little bit more of a policy question, but I, I'd like to hear it from you. Um, your work, I mean, this work is, is really like industry driven, right? Um, and uh, we talked about standards and a lot about the issues we have with standards in, in being too fixated, not necessarily innovation friendly. Uh, is codes of conduct a in-between for you? Um, is, is this something with, where, where co-regulation would work? I'm asking this, of course, in, with the background of European law where more and more initiatives go towards co-regulation and a lot of disputes I had with micro, former Microsoft with our 
standards team because they thought codes of conducts are also standards. For me, codes of conducts are more lawmaking than standardization processes. And I just want to hear a little bit how you see these different words and names and, and tags coming together. Yeah, that's very interesting. I don't know how the sausage is made in co-regulation. I would love to learn more about how, how the decision-making really gets done. To me, codes of conduct often come up as part of good governance. Is that where we, we mean the same thing by it? Yeah, yes, absolutely. A good governance for a um, techn techno technological standards organization absolutely requires a code of conduct along with a lot of other apparatus so that people know how to participate, that their contributions aren't wasted, and so that you know when decisions are made and how appeals are made and all of that stuff. Yeah, I think that's super important. I don't think technology solves things. I think people solve things with technology. All right, can I get a round of applause for Lisa and thank you for joining us. Uh, it's been a long day. It's been a great day. I've really enjoyed this. I feel like the road ahead for portability may be a little bumpier than some of us were thinking just based on everything that's coming up. But, you know, we're driving on it anyway, and we're just going to bump in that car along the way and see how far we can get and how fast. Uh, I wanted to sort of give one last chance for the people in the audience, and some of you have been here all day. Anyone want to offer any thoughts or jump in? And it's okay if you don't want to, but I'm eyeing a couple people who have been here for a little while in case they want to jump in, show a little more perspective. Yeah? Yeah? Any thoughts? Come on. You want to jump in? Throw a thought in here? Just to get, just, you haven't, you haven't asked a question yet. Yeah. Sam, yeah, let's get, just get a little more audience participation. Do we, here, let me grab, I got you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've done teaching before. I know how this works. No, I think just observing in uh, all the conversations, I think for me, it's, what's really interesting work that I can relate to is... Uh, um, Do you want to give your name, by the way? Oh, order? sorry. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Shamak from uh, MasterCard. I work on digital identity and um, open banking. Uh, so actually, I was going to invoke open banking as a, Great. as an example of data yeah. portability. Uh, lots, of, lots of issues still, lots of yeah. things to solve, yeah. but uh, just wondering to what extent, you know, I think my observation is just, I think there's a lot for us to look into and learn and see. Going back, I think, to the original question of the business model of open banking and yeah. what actually drives data portability. And it's really interesting, at least in my conversations, which resonated, I think, with, with what the panel was discussing is just the crux is, I would argue that in, in most banks, half the people look at open banking as a cost center, as a risk. Yeah. And the other half looks at it as an opportunity because your user or my user at a particular bank will go to a one fintech, try open banking. If it doesn't work, we'll go to another. If it doesn't work, and we'll go to, go to a third fintech. And if it doesn't work, then we'll say, okay, at, on my fourth app, I'm just going to try to connect with a different bank uh, because that clearly doesn't work. So I think this dynamic of whether what data portability enables and the new business model, I, I think, was really interesting um, connecting to the work that you do. Thank you. That was a really good point. You can just leave it on the table. We'll get it at the end. But I'm glad that I randomly called on you. I promise I didn't prompt him at all. Um, both, to, both to get the substance of that point in and to showcase that, that this is an issue that's broader than just the designated gatekeepers in the EU or some academics who are writing some papers about it, right? This is felt in a lot of different places, a lot of different sectors. And it's important to sort of have this big collective of perspectives and ideas. And I mean, as, a, as a, someone who has worked in tech policy in industry or sort of industry, depending on how people characterize Mozilla, um, a 50-50 ratio of viewing work as cost center versus opportunity is actually pretty good. I think a lot of industry policy is more heavily on the cost center side, but that may be changing. And it may be changing around work and opportunities like portability and like work downstream of the DMA, where there really is an opportunity, like the business, the business panel earlier, there's an opportunity to show good and to show value for users in this space, and I'm really excited about that. Okay. Last thing I want to talk about is just a little bit of what comes next. You heard a little bit from Lisa about what comes next for DTI on the technology work that we're doing, a little bit more on the policy work. So very, very practically, pragmatically, we had these seven wonderful people come and write papers that they presented to you today. We're going to do some editing of those and compiling them together and then release that as sort of the first DTI volume of the future of data portability in the law. Uh, we're excited for that. There will probably be some thoughts from me mixed in somewhere because I can't help myself. So that'll all come out in the weeks to come. 
Uh, and I want to ask for help from everyone here and everyone on the, lost, the, the live stream to raise awareness of this. So despite all the complexities that we've been talking about, portability is real and it is worth investing in. And this supply versus demand point, let's figure out how we can up the demand side of that, right? I think there's so much more value that can be gotten out of this work on portability that's growing. You can't force it. You can't tell somebody, you need to take this data, you need to figure out some value to get out of it. That's not how it works. But we can close gaps in awareness and understanding. We can invite more people to the table. We can build a bigger table, and we'll just bring more people around it. And that's something that DTI is going to do quite a lot of, I think, in the, in the months to come, and, and I'd love your help with it. Uh, more about our policy work. So we're going to continue showing up here. We're going to continue showing up in the European Union. Um, we are doing a lot with Brussels and with the EU. We're going to start doing more in London, in the UK. We're going to do something in Korea, where they're doing quite a lot of work on this issue as well. Portability is growing, and it's, uh, it's important to be part of those conversations everywhere. And if we're going to be at DTI, the hub of thought and execution on portability, we have to be wherever it is. So, so we're going to do our best to do that with our team of three and some uh, very, very helpful consultants uh, along the way there. And uh, more collaborations. We want to and will add more partners and more collaborators to this work. We've built actually already in the past 13 months or so of activity a really exciting network of people. You can see a lot of that on display in this room and in the people who were kind enough to come when I harangued them and asked them to come and be part of this event. Uh, but we're going to continue growing that. We're going to continue being a hub for that because this is the time. We are at a moment in the policy world, and data portability is the kind of issue that I think can really bring people together and can help us forge a constructive and positive path forward and really do some good. And, you know, we've got a lot of elections coming up this year, and it's a moment in time when I think the policy world is willing to look beyond the next three months, beyond the next six months, willing to look at what we want the world to look like several years from now and start thinking strategically about that long term. And I believe data portability is a big part of that equation, and I think lots of others will too. And that individual empowerment, which is again at the core of our mission, should be part of the core of tech policy agendas all around the world for the next several years. So data portability will be key for that to be realized. But the main message I want to share at this point in time is thank you. Thank you to everyone who's here speaking. Thank you to all of you who are in the audience and listening along. Thanks to our speakers who took time out of their schedules. Thank you to our scholars who are helping to shape the future of data portability with the work that they're doing. Thank you to my colleagues at DTI. Thank you, Delara. Thank you, Lisa, for everything that you're doing to help make this organization great. And thank you to our partners, Google, Apple, and Meta, who have been working with us along this journey, uh, making so many contributions to our shared mission. And with that, I'm going to suggest we fulfill a time-honored DC tradition and go have snacks and drinks. Thanks. Thank you all.